In this video we're going to be talking about probability and how to set up uh, probability into uh, tables and trees. So as a reminder probability is the chance or uh, how likely it is uh, of an event occurring, right? So if we're talking about something like we're going to roll a die uh, in our board game, what are the different things that can happen? How likely is it that I'm going to roll a six, right? And that's kind of what we're looking for with probability. So just a couple other definitions. Um, independent events. So independent events is when the outcome of one event has absolutely no impact on the outcome of another event, right? So if you think about the board game Monopoly, uh, in Monopoly you roll two die, right? Or two dice. So we roll two six-sided dice in Monopoly. Those are what we would call independent events. Because if we were to use a red die and a blue die, when we roll them, whatever happens on the red one has absolutely no impact on the blue one. And I always have students say, well, what if they hit each other in mid-air? Then it, it could change what it was going to be. And that's true, it could collide, but when the red die hits the blue die, does it all of a sudden turn into a coin instead of a die? No, it would still stay as a die, and the things I can get are still 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So it does not change what the outcomes could be, all right? So it might change, oh yeah, it was going to land on a 3, but now it lands on a 2, but it hasn't changed what the outcomes could be. So it hasn't changed what our possibilities are. Are. So in that case, they are independent events because what I get on the red die would have zero impact on what I can get on the blue die. Okay. Now we talk a lot about sample space. So the sample space is really just all of the possible outcomes of a probability experiment. And when I'm talking about probability uh, experiments, oh, I spelled probability wrong. How embarrassing. Uh, <clears throat> When I spell, uh, no, when I spell probability, I should do it properly. 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 Um, so all of the possible outcomes, so that's all of the different things that could happen. Okay, so we've got to cover all of the different possibilities. A favorable outcome is referring to a successful result. So if we were talking about earlier when I was rolling the die and I wanted to know what is my chances of rolling a six? In that case, my six is a successful result because that's what I'm looking to find, okay? And the way we calculate a probability is by looking at how many favorable outcomes we have, and then we divide by the total number of possible outcomes, okay? So we need to know the sample space, we need to know how many possible outcomes there are, and we need to know how many of those outcomes are favorable or will give us what we would call a successful result. So let's look at uh, developing the sample space in order to answer some of these questions. So hopefully you saw something like this in grade 7. It says use a tree diagram to show and list the whole sample space for the independent events of flipping a coin and spinning a spinner labeled 1, 2, 3. So here we have my coin, you can see there's the dollars. And here's our spinner, it's a circle, and it's split into three equal sections labeled one, two, three, so they're labeled differently. And then there would be a little arrow that's fixed in the middle and it spins around the circle and will stop somewhere and points at a certain spot. Or uh, if you need to make your own spinner at home, you could draw out a circle, have these three regions. You could take a pencil and put your pencil down right in the center and then take a paper clip and uh, I guess put the paper clip down first and then put your pencil down inside of the paper clip on the center and you can flick the paper clip and it will spin around and around and around and eventually land in an and point at a specific number, okay? So, the way I start by drawing my tree diagram, I'm going to look at my coin first, okay? So if you think of a coin that you've seen before, a coin, there are two possible things when I flip the coin, two possible outcomes when I flip the coin. I can get heads or I can get tails. Those are the only two outcomes I have. And no, the coin cannot land on its side. Quit trying to cheat and find holes in my example. You can get heads or you can get tails. So I'll write that out a little bit. Heads, tails. And what we do is we kind of just draw two branches like this. And we think of our starting point as, okay, I'm going to find all of the different paths or all of the different possibilities. So if I flip my coin, starting from nothing, I can either move and get a heads or move and get a tails. Those are my two outcomes. Okay. My second thing I'm going to look at is the spinner. 
So when I spin the spinner, what are the different options I have? So I can get either a 1, a 2, or a 3. Now, I could be along the path where I flipped heads first. And then I'm going to spin the spinner, and when I spin the spinner, I can get either a 1, a 2, or a 3. So it's possible that I flipped heads first, and then spun a 1, a 2, or a 3. Those are all three possibilities if I flipped heads first. And then if I had flipped tails instead of heads, does that change what I can get on the spinner? Well, no. Flipping tails, I can still spin a 1, a 2, or a 3. So if I had flipped a tails first, then my options on the spinner are also 1 and 2 and 3. And so now I've covered both of my independent events. One does not impact the outcome of the other. And so here is all of my outcomes, or what we would call our sample space. So if I was to follow along this path, I flipped a heads and then I spun a one. Or if I follow along this path here, I flipped a heads and then I spun a two, or heads and three or tails, and one, or tails, and two, or tails, and three. And those are all of my different outcomes. And I really just follow along all the different possible paths, right? And so as I follow along my different paths, those give me all of the different possible outcomes. So I have my sample space written here on the side, okay? Now, I'm going to look at that a little bit further. So here's the same tree. I just kind of moved it over. Sorry, one of the colors changed. And it says, what is the probability of heads and three? So what I'm looking at here, so P stands for probability. And then in brackets, that's how we know what we're looking for. So this one, I want to have flipping heads on my coin and spinning a three on the spinner. So what is the probability of that happening? So remember, we said probability is equal to the number of favorable outcomes divided by our total number of outcomes. Okay, so for the first one, a favorable outcome would mean I need to get heads and three at the same time. So looking at my outcomes, the first one is flipping heads, which is good, but then spinning a one, which is bad, so not that one. Then the next one is flipping heads, which is good, but spinning a two, that's bad. The next one, flip, uh, spin, uh, flipping a heads and spinning a three. This one is good. I want that one right there. That one's great. And if I look at my others, flipping tails, bad, tails, bad, tails, bad. So the only nut one that works is that one right there. So I have one favorable outcome in this case. How many possible outcomes do I have? Well, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six total possibilities. So my probability is 1 over 6. Now when I write that as a fraction, remember we spent a whole topic going fraction to decimal and decimal to percent, so I could change this into its decimal form uh, if I wanted to, and so that would be 0 0.16 repeating would be the decimal form, and if I change that into its percent, and so when I change from decimal to percent multiplying by 100, this would be equal to 16.6% repeating. So I can change between fraction, decimal, and percent. Okay. For the second one, uh, what is the probability of uh, flipping the tails and then spinning an odd number, right? Okay, so I know none of these three things work because they're all dealing with heads. I need to flip tails. So all three of these I flip tails, but this one here where I flip the two, that's no good. Two is an even number, so this one doesn't work, but flipping a tails and spinning a one is good, and flipping a tails and spinning a three is good. So now I have two favorable outcomes out of my six total possible outcomes, and that would reduce in lowest terms to one third, and of course as a decimal, that's 0 0.3 repeating, and then as a percent, it's 33.3% repeating. So I could change between fraction decimal percent. Okay. Uh, number three, what is the probability of flipping a heads or flipping a tails? Okay, so uh, it doesn't say anything about my spinner. I just need to flip a heads or a tails. So I flip a heads here, so that would work, and here, and here, and then here I flip a tails, that would work, and that, oh, that, that kind of means as, as long as I remember to flip the coin, I'm good, because all six of these outcomes have either heads or tails. So this has 
a 100% chance of happening, right? This as a decimal is one, and so it has a 100% chance of happening. As long as I actually flip the coin, it has to happen. I'm going to get either a heads or a tails. I'm not going to get a lizard or, um, I, I don't know, I, I, can, I can only get heads and tails. Those are my only options, right? Uh, the fourth one, what is the probability of flipping a heads and spinning a five? Well, okay, flip heads there in those three, but spin one, two, three. So none of, none of those work. I, I, I can't spin a five. It can't happen. So that one has no chance of happening. So it is possible for our uh, for us to set something up that is impossible to happen, and it's also possible to set it up where it's guaranteed to happen, right? So where I'm guaranteed to flip a heads or a tails, but uh, it's impossible for me to spin a five because that spinner I was given only had those three sections. Okay. So the nice thing about the trees, uh, trees you can use regardless of how many things you want to do. So if I wanted to flip a coin and spin a spinner and roll a dice and take a card from a deck, I could use a tree to chart all of that. I can do as many different things as I want. The disadvantage with trees is they get messy and they get crazy and they're hard to keep track of. So uh, trees are great if you need more than two events, okay? Now a table. That's the next one we're going to do. A table is only good for two events. You cannot use a table to handle three events. It's only going to work with two. So this one says use a table to show and list the whole sample space for the independent events of rolling two six-sided dice. And we're going to differentiate between them. I'm going to make one of them a yellow die and one of them a green die just so it's easier for us to see. So when I'm making the table, I want to kind of go across the top and so I'm going to just look at my yellow one first. I'm going to put all the possibilities for my yellow die across the top in a row like this. So the things I can get on a six-sided die are one, two, three, four, five, and six. Those are my possible outcomes on that yellow die. On my green die, so I've got my green die going down the side here, I'm going to put all my possibilities in a column. So in that column, my possibilities on my green die, again, I can roll a 1, a 2, a 3, 4, 5, or 6. So those are all my possible outcomes for each of the different die. Now, to make it into a table, I kind of extend some lines out this way, and in between all of my different outcomes I need a line, so I'm going to extend all these lines out, and then same thing going this way, I'm going to bring my lines down, and uh, the part here that says yellow, I'm just going to put that in its own little box, right, so it's just kind of like my title, letting me know I'm dealing with my yellow die roll up top, and then down the side I'm going to put the green one in its own little box just to say that, hey, this is the green die and all of the possibilities for that one. Now, the way I would fill in this table is going across my row like this. Going across this row means I have rolled a green one. So I would fill in a green one all the way across that row. And then going down this way, is a yellow one in this column going down. So if I was going to fill in my yellow number, I would fill in a one going all the way down like this. And then in my next column over, everything is a yellow two. So I fill in my yellow two like this, coming all the way down the column. And going across the row would be a green two. So I would fill in green twos going all the way across the column. So you probably don't want to watch me fill all of this out, so I'm just going to skip ahead where I filled it in a little bit nicer, and I put some nice straight lines in instead of my scribbles. So there's my chart. So I've got all of my different possible outcomes. So I could roll a one on my green die and a one on my yellow die or a two on my green die and a four on my yellow die. So it just has all the different possibilities. And just in the terms of dice, having them as different colors makes it easy to see the different possibilities. So yes, this one where I roll a three and a one is the same as this one where I roll a three and a one, but this green dice is my three, and this yellow dice is my three. So they switch numbers. It would be the same total, right? Three plus one is four, but it's two different ways of making that happen, okay? So here we go. What is the probability of? Let's see. It says green two 
and a yellow six. So I need to find a green two. So here's my green two row. So I kind of look across and I got to go to where it's a yellow six. Here we go, green two, yellow six. This is the only one that is a green two and a yellow six. The other one I have is a green six and a yellow two, but that's not the same thing. I need the colors to match. So I need a green two and a yellow six. So I've got one way of making that happen. Right, so the first question, I got one way of making that happen. Now, how many total outcomes do I have? Okay, let's count them. I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and then hopefully you can see that that's gonna be 18, and then 24, and then 30, and 36. If you don't believe me, pause your video and count them out, but there's gonna be 36 possible outcomes. Now, off the top of my head, I don't know that one as it's decimal and a percent, so that is left for you to figure out if you wanna convert between them. Remember, numerator divided by denominator gives you your decimal. Take that decimal, multiply by 100, and that gives you your percent. The second one, what is the probability of getting an even number for green and an odd number for yellow? So I'm going to use a, a color here to kind of help me. So I need green to be even and yellow to be odd. So green being even, uh, that would be all of these ones here. So I'm going to just kind of use my pence or my pen to go across. All of those have a green even number, right? Two is an even number. So do all of these ones going across here are a green even number four, right? And then six is an even number. So all of these ones moving across have six, which is an even number. But I also need yellow to be odd. Okay, so I'm gonna take red to be my odds. Uh, here's an odd number. One is a odd yellow number, so I'm gonna go down like this, okay? And three is an odd number, and five is an odd number. And so my answer here is going to be where my blue and my red are the same. So here, let me go here, okay? So this one here, it touches, right? So we've got blue and red are both in that box, and then blue and red are both in this box. And when we look at these ones, we see that our green value is even, and our yellow value is odd. So all of the ones that would have been filled in, blue and red, are now going to be colored in. So those ones are our values that are both even and odd. So a green being even, and <clears throat> odd being yellow. I just drew nine dots, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine spots that match. There are still 36 total outcomes, so I have nine over 36, which reduces to one quarter, which is the same thing as 0.25 or 25%. So when I roll those dice, I have a 25% chance of getting an even number on the green die and a odd number on the yellow die, okay? Last question here, what is the probability of getting a sum of six? Okay, so that means when I add the two dice together, I need to get a value of six. So what are some ways we could get six? So I could go, I could go three plus three, that would give me six. Oh, and I could go four plus two, uh, but if I go four plus two, I can also go two plus four, right? So that one works. And then I can go five plus one gives me six, and well, so does one plus five. So if you look, I've got one, two, three, four, five ways of getting a sum of six. That means when I add the numbers together, I get six. So there were five favorable outcomes out of the 36. So that's using our table to help us show the entire sample space. So here is showing the entire sample space. That's all of the possible things that can happen, right? Every possible outcome is written inside this table here, okay? Then we can use the sample space, once we've got, got it written out, to find things that we would call favorable, okay? So remember probability, number of favorable outcomes on the top, total number on the bottom. Again, disadvantages of the table, you can only do it with two independent events. You can't add a third independent event. Your table no longer works, so you would need to use a tree. However, it is so much neater and organized than the tree, and it's easier to kind of spot patterns within the table from time to time. All right, there is tables and trees.